Good day, everyone, and welcome to another session of uh, the CORE's master classes. We are uh, super excited today, more than usual, um, because um, we have a dear friend um, and an ecosystem shaker and mover who uh, we adore and we uh, feel is inspiring so many people and we look up to and uh, we, we support as uh, they support us and, and the ecosystem. So it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Tamara Abdel Jabir, uh, who is um, a partner and a founder at Imam Ventures. Uh, she's a supporter and empower of both men and women, but with a women twist. <laughs> She, uh, the fund is focused on gender lens investments um, and uh, accelerate startups within Jordan uh, and Egypt. Um, there's a lot of initiatives under uh, Imam, for example, Arkan and other numerous programs that create uh, impact within, within the ecosystem and also provide pipeline. She currently serves as the past chair of the Global Institute of Certified Management Consultants. Also, she's a board member uh, at the International Council of Management. Her previous career involved consulting. She founded and was the chairman of Palma Consulting. And she also uh, co-founded um, Women uh, Business Arabia, which is a virtual community, which organically grew to over 45,000 women, professional women members from across the region. Um, she's also part of uh, Vital Voices Global Leadership Network, and we love what uh, Tamara has to say. And Tamara, let me share something with you. I was going through my, my journals, and this came up from, uh, can you see it? Wait. I can see it. Wow. <laughs> this brings back memories. I met, I met, oh, met Tamara in 2017 through a mutual friend and over sushi, and then that quickly moved to her office at, at Palma. And she gifted me this uh, notebook as we were discussing ecosystem stuff. And I'm so happy I found it because that's when I was starting my own company as well and vetting some of the ideas and mapping. So maybe uh, in our next uh, outing, Tamara, I'll, I'll bring it with me so we can laugh about some of the things that uh, I was thinking about at that time um, and uh, uh, really reconnect with what uh, you guys are doing and what we guys are doing, what we are doing. So Tamara's session today is fundraising. You know, you're a startup, you need to raise money. Uh, fundraising is more than just asking for money. Fundraising is a continuous process of relationship management. It is not easy. Uh, some people have a gift for it, but regardless of whether you have a gift or not, there are ways, uh, good ways and not so good ways to go about it. So we're very happy uh, to be uh, joined by Tamara today to discuss uh, fundraising uh, as a process. So Tamara, thank you for being with us and uh, the floor is yours, my dear. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here with you, um, dear friends and uh, uh, colleagues. So yeah, uh, I'm always excited to work with you, Yazan and Rizé and Nadine, of course. And um, I hope that today's session will shed some light uh, on what fundraising is all about, what investor management is all about. Being uh, um, an investment fund meant that we had to go through a fundraising pro process ourselves. We're still going through that because this is always, uh, this is ongoing. Um, so I understand what a lot of you are going through and I hope that what I'll be sharing today um, will help you navigate that uh, uh, process because I tell you it's, it's not an easy one, but it can be fun um, if uh, you learn how to do it properly. So again, uh, thank you, uh, the core, for including me today. Ooh, uh, I hope you know what I'll be sharing will add value uh, to your journeys. So when we talk about uh, uh, fundraising, it is all about raising money. Uh, it's not just something that startups do. It's also what charities and nonprofits do as well. Um, so it's an important function in any organization that uh, basically is core to its sustainability and growth. Um, in a startup context, this is an organized effort to convince investors to back you financially by injecting new money into your company uh, in exchange for either a loan or equity, depending on the instrument that you're using. 
Now, when it comes to investor relations, you have investors, uh, but uh, you need to build a systemic practice um, to help you communicate with your investors. Uh, these are the people who have already bought into your company to answer the questions and their concerns. And this doesn't just happen haphazardly. You need to put in a conscious effort to make that happen in order for you to continue building that relationship with your investor. So in today's session, you will learn how fundraising is different or is not different from sales and how to go about fundraising and then how to manage your investor relations and what are the uh, some of the good practices around um, investor relationship uh, uh, management. Um, please feel free to uh, drop in your questions in the chat, and uh, I'll look at those every now and then. Uh, Nadine, help me if there is uh, if I miss some some questions. Um, let's let's take a few uh, uh, um, minutes to uh, go back to basics and understand the type uh, the types of funding that you can consider. Um, naturally, funding really depends on the stage that you're business is at. So if you're still at the idea stage, you need to look at self-financing, you need to look at uh, um, founders, friends, and family to give you uh, the funding that you need to start your business. Um, when you actually have a more formal business, this is where you look at angel investing. All throughout, there are some grants out there that you need to uh, um, uh, try and attract. Um, you go through the value of death. That's when you're uh, still trying to get your first customer, but your finances are limited. So you need to basically balance how you get to that first customer without running out of money. When you get to your growth stage, when that's when you reach your break even, this is when more investors will start becoming interested um, in your business. When you get to the maturity level, this is where bank financing also becomes an option in addition to the different stages of investor financing. We'll talk more about that throughout, but it's, also, it's always important to understand where your business are is in terms of maturity, in terms of level of profit and level of revenues before you actually approach investors. Because again, remember that as investors, and I can speak uh, uh, confidently about that myself, we receive numerous requests for funding and uh, um, we have limited time. So we want to make sure that uh, we get those requests that actually fit what we're looking for as investors. Um, those that come to us too early, for instance, or too late, or are out of our geographic, geographical scope, um, they'll be wasting the limited time that we have to actually help those that need our help and are actually our target. Um, and uh, um, you don't want to be knocking on everyone's door. You want to be knocking on the doors that are relevant to you uh, in order to increase your chances of getting the right investor. So looking at the different types that are out there, there is love money or patient capital. It's the money that comes from family, friends, and fools. Uh, these are the people who believe in what you're doing. These uh, um, are looking to support you no matter what. And usually the seeds 35 to 40% of startups globally every year. This is not a donation. Those people are expecting, uh, uh, they're hoping that they would get their money back. They're expecting to see your business grow. And at the same time, this money comes with challenges in that it can strain your relationships with those people if you're not telling them what's going on with your business, if they're seeing that you're not taking it seriously. Um, so you need to be careful about that. Um, so in order for you to get that money, you need to fig figure out whether you're asking them for a loan or a cash investment in return for equity in your company. You need to hold a formal meeting to present or pitch your business and your ask. Um, don't take it for granted. You need to provide solid documentation. Show them your business plan, your SWOT analysis, some basic financial projections, why what you're building will be different from the competition that's out there. And you need to formalize that relationship. You need to have legal agreements in place. You need to be consistent in reporting to them, updating them, etc. Otherwise, every family uh, gathering, every interaction with, uh, with friends will turn into uh, um, an uncomfortable situation or simply a board meeting. 
Angel investors are another type of funding, and these this is the capital that comes from private individuals. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's high net worth individuals. Uh, it's it comes in return for equity or as a convertible loan. Uh, these people um, know that your high risk, your startup is still high risk, so they expect a high return, and uh, they are willing to provide you with more favorable terms in uh, compared to other investors. So in order to get uh, that type of funding, you need to know who you are pitching to. You need to research those angel investors, uh, learn about what they previously invested in, what they are interested in looking at. You need to prepare a, a good pitch deck. You need to practice. Um, you need to provide solid documentation, whether it's a business plan, SWOT analysis, financial projections. You need to make sure that your paperwork is ready. And again, you need to be consistent in reporting and updating your investors. And that last line is where investor relations comes in. And this is what we'll be talking on about uh, uh, later on in the session. Venture capital, this is where uh, um, uh, you are targeting funds that invest in um, companies. These are funds that invest other people's money. So just like us at Amman Ventures, we're putting in a tiny bit of our own money into uh, our investments, but it's mainly uh, us investing on behalf of other people or other funds. And that means that uh, um, we need to be extra careful in uh, the companies we invest in. That's why we do a lot of analysis and due diligence before we commit to investing in a company. Funds invest in return for equity or convertible loans, and they're always looking at startups with high growth potential. So the role of the investment fund is to make sure that this growth potential is there. They need to assess that and get some uh, clarity and some uh, comfort around it. Again, uh, we're looking at going big or going home. So we're looking at high risk and high return. In order for you to prepare for uh, fundraising from uh, uh, venture capital or VC funds, you need to be ready to answer questions like what stage we are, you need to do your homework. What stage do those funds invest in? What's their ticket size? Do they have a specific focus, geography, timeline? Again, I get a lot of those cold emails, uh, um, startups in India, startups in the US, and they're just knocking doors. And I'm one of, I can safely say that I'm one of very few investors who actually reply to those people and tell them, sorry, you're out of scope for us. But a lot of people don't even bother to answer because it's obvious that those startups and those startup founders have not, have not done their homework. They haven't done basic research to understand where uh, we as a fund are investing. And I can safely tell you that, again, all this information is out there whether researching on the website of the different investment funds, whether looking at networks uh, where those investors exist, looking at or being part of networking events, asking around, the information is out there. You need to do your homework. You need to do your research before you go in and approach investors. You need to be prepared. Depending on the stage you're at, you might need a good teaser and a deck, or you need a data room where you have all the details that we as investors would be looking to see, whether it's your legal documents, your financial projections, bios of your key team members, et cetera. So you need to, again, prepare yourself before you approach the investor. And once the investor starts talking to you, you need to have this data readily available. You can't go back and say that, give me two weeks and I'll share the link to my data room. That data room needs to be ready so that you can send that email with the link on the same day or the next day. Because again, investors receive a lot of requests from startups and you need to be able to uh, um, uh, ride that momentum. If the investor showed interest, you need to follow through immediately. Before talking to investors, you need to practice your pitch and your presence. You need to show confidence. You need to be able to answer difficult questions. You need to be able to follow up with whatever required materials. You need to make sure that you have a good lawyer who understands your business, who understands your industry, and is able to um, look at term sheets, give you the right advice, and then look at investment agreements. 
and it, you have to have a superstar team. Your team needs to be strong and you need to have good mentors and a good advisory board in order to help you navigate this process. Another type of funding is debt or loans. And these take many different forms. Uh, these come from banks, but also microfinance institutions, lending companies, et cetera. They usually require co co collateral or guarantees. Um, and to access debt from banks and others, you will need to have a formal business. You need to have a business bank account and be in good standing. And again, you will need to provide collateral or guarantees or have um, someone come in act as a co-signatory to you uh, with you on the loan, etc. To go uh, uh, to microfinance institutions and get smaller amounts of debt, you will need to have a formal business. In all cases, you need to present a solid case uh, on why you need the money and how you will be able to pay it back. Um, again, one thing that we see a lot of startups missing on is understanding their financials. You need to be able to answer questions immediately when it comes to your uh, uh, revenue projections, your cash flow projections, your uh, previous performance, et cetera. And one thing you need to keep in mind when talking to banks is that you need to build that relationship even before you actually need it. You need to maintain a good relationship with the lenders throughout. Mezzanine financing, this is hybrid financing that mixes debt and equity. And again, uh, it can take different forms. The one thing, one of them is what we offer at Imam Ventures, which is revenue-based financing. So basically it's a, a type of loan where we come in as a, a shareholders acquiring a very small stake of equity, allowing us to uh, um, give a loan and that loan gets paid back from the revenue of a business. So it's a self-liquidating instrument. And it's very interesting for those who are looking for non-dilutive uh, options. So again, before talking to that type of investors offering mezzanine financing, you still need to be able to understand what stage they invest in, what are their ticket sizes, if, we, if they have a specific focus. Just like a VC fund, you need to be prepared. You need to have a good teaser, a deck, a data room. Uh, you need to practice your pitch and your presence and be ready to answer difficult questions. Having good lawyers is extremely important. And again, a superstar team, including an advisory board and mentors. If you're a non-tax small business, there are also other options out there that you need to consider because non-tax small businesses, they do not fit the typical VC model. They're too small for private equity. And in a lot of cases, they don't have collateral to access bank financing. So their options are microloans, going to microfinance organizations, asset-based lenders who are uh, willing to offer financing in return for uh, um, liens on the assets that you're looking to buy. Mezzanine loans are an option. Bank loans can be an option if you manage to find a collateral or some sort of a guarantee. Private equity, once you get to a bigger stage, when you're a larger business, if you're non-tech, then private equity would become an option. Now. Before raising fund, uh, money, before you are funding, you need to uh, uh, not spend whatever you have on building the app or building your product. You need to create a prototype, something that can get validation from your customers, as well as use while pitching to investors in order for you to get ready to start generating revenue really fast. Once you've gotten past the initial validation, this is when you start uh, building your team or hiring developers uh, or outsourcing development to a company to help you build your platform or your mobile app. And during that period, there are several funding ideas that you can tap into um, when you start with your business idea. You need to look at uh, um, campaigns by big brands. There are some brands out there that are uh, launching competitions that are willing to fund some ideas. A few years ago, Huggies, the diaper company, uh, they ran a campaign that they called Mom Inspired. They called for applications from all mompreneurs uh, in the US um, who are 20 years and older, uh, who have an original, innovative, and viable new product idea to help make it easier for parents. The prize was $15,000. That might not be sizable, but it's, it's a good start for a business uh, that can that is looking for the first stage to formalize and uh, run with an idea. 
PepsiCo also ran a program called PepsiCo uh, 10. It's a program where they invited startups to apply with app ideas. Uh, they evaluated proposals based on the applicant's uh, ability to partner with PepsiCo's brands um, and based on their uh, commercial viability. They were offered a trip to New York City to meet with a marketing leadership team, uh, um, an opportunity to uh, interact with digital influencers, and hence generate revenues for their businesses. Uber had another campaign called Uber Pitch, again, where they were looking uh, at pitching ideas to VCs while having an Uber ride. So I don't I know that these are not uh, um, there's there isn't too many of those ideas uh, in this part of the world. But again, some exist and you need to be on the lookout for those ideas. Um, negotiating an advance from a customer. Again, if you have a product that can add value to a certain customer, uh, you look at you can. Uh, um, try and sell that product before you actually launched. And customers can be ready to buy those products. They can be ready to white label uh, or license some of those products and give you an advance in order for you to further develop your product. Now, when we look at uh, um, uh, VC funding, uh, it basically fluctuates depending on what's happening in global economies. Startups worldwide in 2022 raised $415 billion from investors. That was down from 2021, 35% down, which was the global all-time high. Um, and that's why you hear a lot of people saying that it's becoming harder to fundraise. This means that investors are becoming pickier about the startups uh, that they're looking to invest in. But for a startup in Jordan, how do you go about to get the funding that you need? The number and types of funding options can be overwhelming. And to understand what you need, uh, um, the understanding what's out there helps you determine what you need and what aligns with your company goals. So again, one option could be self-funding. 39% of founders fund through their personal, their own funds, their personal funds. Self-funding means that you independently provide the funding that you need for your business. This might come from your personal savings, uh, starting with a long uh, timeline, running on a time budget. Again, that's uh, something that you need to go through at the start of your business. And this is very important because this helps um, whoever you're raising funds from at a later stage, see that you actually believe that you actually believe in your idea, that you committed to funding your idea, you put your money where your mouth is. Um, and some of the self-funding strategies are bootstrapping. And this is just, this isn't just using your personal funds. This is like we said, tapping into uh, um, start early revenues, uh, looking at family and friends, um, but basically instead of uh, um, diluting your, your equity, this is where you're looking at uh, other sources around you to get started. This means that um, if you fail, um, God forbid, but that's there's a big probability that that can happen, uh, as, as uh, you all well know, you lose your savings or you lose the money that your family and friends uh, put in with you. But again, uh, it's something that you need, a risk that you need to take when you're starting a business. Credit cards can be another way for you to start your business. Um, but again, you need to be very careful um, at how you manage your cash flows because this can be an expensive way for you to fund your business. 17% of startups use credit cards uh, as a source for their startup funding. But interest rates can be high. There are penalties. You need to make sure that you manage the payments in an efficient manner in order for you not to suffer as you grow your business. Another idea could be barter, and there are options out there as well. It's a good way for you to finance big purchases, furniture, equipment, advertising, etc. Customer commitments, again, going to a cust an early customer and getting them to commit uh, to providing payments or buying your products, promote it, promoting your product. Incubators and accelerators can be a good way for you to fund your business, whether through in-kind services, but also some uh, grants and, and uh, uh, awards that you get. Now, 
Traditionally, startup funding focused on small or an elite group of founders, but this industry has been growing um, and it's been looking at supporting founders who don't have access to private equity, don't have access to loans. Um, incubators and accelerators are programs that startups can tap into, especially those who are starting programs, uh, starting businesses for the first time. Um, startups and uh, incubators and accelerators offer capital, mentorship, and networking. And the lines between incubators and accelerators are becoming rare every day. So incubators help you focus uh, on developing your business plan, your website, your minimum viable product. If you have an MVP already, then they provide you uh, um, with mentorship, uh, um, maybe funding, networking connections, et cetera. And incubators have a flexible schedule. So you can spend longer time at uh, an incubator versus an accelerator where you go to expedite your growth. Uh, these are competitive programs. Um, they work based on cohort. And a lot of times they provide limited funding in exchange for equity. Um, they run at a shorter schedule than incubation uh, uh, programs. Now, one thing to be uh, conscious of is that a lot of companies jump uh, or startups jump between incubators and accelerators, and you see them signing up for a lot of incubation and acceleration programs. These, are, can, these can be uh, time consuming for you. They can be very demanding on your time as startup founders. So uh, beware of doing too much of incubation and acceleration or doing too little. Again, we see pitches where startups have been in incubators and acceleration, acceleration programs for years on end and going from one brand to the next without getting to that stage where they have a minimum viable product um, that they're ready to sell to clients. And that can be very unattractive to investors. So ultimately, you need to figure out what type of funding is ready for your startup. And this is where a mentor or an advisor can be very helpful in guiding you. But also, it's your call to go about fundraising. It's something that you need to be responsible for as a founder. This is something that uh, um, you need to be uh, running in your business. That's not something that you can outsource, or it's not something that you can um, ask one of your employees uh, or team members to actually hand it for you. Let's look at rounds because again, that's one thing that, uh, uh, that we hear a lot of. Some of this information might be basic for some of you, but I know that uh, uh, some of you haven't, don't, don't understand those rounds. So I hope that this can shed some lights. Pre-seed funding, it's, uh, um, it's basically uh, uh, taking place when you're looking at getting your business off the ground. It's the earliest stage of funding for a company, and it involves investment from, again, your personal savings, family, friends, supporters, and uh, possibly a network of other founders who believe in your idea. This round can go on for years. Uh, as you develop your startup, or if you prove yourself, it can happen rather quickly and you can jump to the next round, which is seed funding. Seed funding, it's the official funding, uh, first funding round that you raise, and it's often tied to equity. And this is where you can uh, um, finance your early steps through uh, to conduct product research, launching a product, marketing to your audience, building an audience. And it's the seed that helps you grow your business and flourish with your business. Without it, you won't be able to hire a team. You won't be able to test your idea or test your market. It can come from family and friends, but in a lot of cases, it comes from angel investors, incubators, and investment firms. Um, and the round can vary. So uh, it can start from something as small as $10,000. But again, depending on your idea, it can go up to $2 million. It's really about what you're trying to do with your business. The next round is Series A. Now, in between uh, Seed and Series A, you can look at bridge find a bridge round, something that can help you um, uh, get to your Series A if you're not there yet. But once you use your seed funding to develop your product and build a customer base, this is the time for your next step. And your Series A funding round can help you expand your product offering, uh, bring in more customers, develop a long-term plan for growth. And uh, startups in this phase, they often attract investors from traditional private equity firms, from VC funds. 
in the US, um, in the first half of 2022, the, the average uh, ticket size for a, C a Series A round was $20 million. And again, valuations, especially in the tech industry, they vary a lot. And this obviously impacts what a Series A round uh, can, uh, can be at. Series B is the next round. It's all about the business development and reaching the next level of growth. And this is used to help support and hire new talent, boosting sales, marketing, developing the technology and customer service. In the US in 2022, the average round was $50 million. In 2020, it was 35 million. So that's, that was a big jump. We don't get to that level here yet, but we're not very far from that. Uh, although it's it's very hard to see companies get to that uh, uh, stage in general. This round, again, can attract traditional private equity firms and later stage investment firms. This is followed by Series A, C, which is uh, uh, the series that's there for successful startups who need extra funding to create new products, acquire companies, expand into new markets, and hire an exceptional leadership team, because this is when you're looking at building your C-level executives um, uh, and, and uh, your uh, basically your management team, uh, as well as boost your numbers before you're looking at exiting in an IPO. And the range can go from like up to $88 million uh, or 80, even more. And this was a slight jump from what happened uh, the year before. Um, startups that get to Series C are already successful. So this is less, res less risky for investors. And this means that uh, um, more investors can get involved at this stage. Um, investors include private equity firms, hedge funds, secondary market groups, and investment banks. Series D and beyond, we don't see much of that. Few companies extend beyond Series C into D or E rounds. Um, businesses uh, um, going for this round of funding are looking for a final influx before they get to their goals. Uh, they might need that before they go public. A company at this stage should have an established customer base, established revenue streams, a track record of growth, and a solid plan of how they would use this, this capital. Now, to get ready to any of those stages, there's, there's a lot um, that you need to do as founders. You need to start by calculating your funding needs. So it's extremely important and uh, it can be embarrassing if you go to an investor asking for investment and you don't know how much you need and where you're using that money. So before contacting investors, before applying for a loan, you need to know how much money you need to achieve your business goals whether you're looking for a small one-time sum where a business loan or a grant can be a good fit, or you need a larger contribution where you need um, an angel investor or a VC firm to come in. You need to create a business plan that um, helps you build confidence with investors or lenders or even the family members that are looking to fund your startup. Your business plan should outline your vision and the opportunity that you're tackling with your startup, uh, the market and the industry. And it should include a marketing plan. It should include clear timelines of what you're looking to achieve. And it should include a competitive analysis. And again, one thing that um, I see a lot of startup founders saying that there is no competition. We are the only ones who came up with this unique idea. If, if you have that uh, answer, if you're, if you're, able to prove that, then you have something that investors will be chasing. But most probably, uh, a lot of you haven't done their research, and there are competition out there uh, that you just haven't uncovered, or you don't want to mention to your investors, but be sure that investors will be doing that research before they give you a dime. Checking your financial health is extremely important. Again, you need to understand your current financial status before you go in and approach investors, whether it's your personal tax returns, whether it's your bank statements, cash flow statements, you need to have those ready. You need to be able to have uh, revenue uh, and expense projections. Based on that, you create profit and loss statements, revenue projections, and this is extremely important for investors. They need to see uh, the runway that you'd be creating with that funding that you're asking for. 
you need to research funding options. Like I mentioned before, uh, you need to do an extensive amount of research to see what's right for your business. There are hundreds of online resources uh, that guide you on approaching investors. Um, they guide you on uh, distributing equity, what you need to expect in those investor relationships. Um, you need to do your research. Some businesses, they need, like we said, a massive amount of capital, especially if they're developing a hardware product. Some need a small loan. So you need to be able to know which doors you need to knock on. One thing that you need to build is an investor tracker, a list of those investors, what those investors are interested in, what they invested in before, the, the geography that they're investing in, the ticket sizes, et cetera, before you go knocking those doors. Whatever the case, it's important for you to figure out your current financing, your funding options before choosing a path. And look at other businesses that are similar to you, uh, what they did, um, how they finance their businesses and get inspiration, whether it's a crowdfunding campaign, a bank loan, or going to an investor. Now, there are rules that you need to, uh, sorry, to follow, not fellow. Um, you need to get fundraising over as soon as possible and get back to building your product and your company. But also, you cannot stop too soon. If fundraising is difficult, you need to keep fighting and stay alive. Um, when you're raising Be Greedy, you don't need to be, be asking for funding for the next six months. Ask for funding for a longer period of time. You need to build that runway. You, you need to be able to focus on developing your product so you don't need to be worrying that your cash flow is running out in two months down the line. Again, you need to uh, uh, talk to as many people as possible and prioritize those that are ready to close. And uh, um, once an investor says, yeah, yes, don't delay. You need to have your documents ready. You need to get them signed so you get your money in the bank as soon as possible. Again, like we learned last time, there's, there's FOMO, but there's also investors not wanting to look stupid and investors having a short span of attention for you. They have a lot on their plate. They get a lot of opportunities. So once they say yes, just go ahead and close that deal. And always hustle for leads. Uh, you might be the hottest deal of the hour. hour. That's, that's great. But again, you need to uh, continue working to get um, other investors interested. Never screw anyone over. You need to hold yourself, your team to the highest ethical standards. Ethics are extremely important. When we look at our part of the world, it's a very small place. Jordan is an extremely small place. A bad reputation is very difficult to prepare, uh, to repair. You need to play it straight. You will never regret that. Investors have a lot of ways to say no. The hardest thing for an entrepreneur is understanding when they are being turned down and being okay with it. Okay, you don't need to keep slurping and making that sucking sound with the, with the straw when the glass is empty. If the investor says no, don't waste his time or yours, just move on to the next one. But also keep checking with them every now and then because another time they might say yes. So keep that investor on your investor tracker. Develop a style that fits you and your company. You need to show how you're different in that relationship with your investor. You need to leave that uh, um, uh, good impression on the investor that you're talking to. You need to be organized and split tasks with your co-founders. Your investor needs to see that there are more people on your team uh, uh, beyond just yourself. Um, use software tools that can help you get organized in order for you to keep track of your uh, deals, of your tasks, et cetera. And you need to have uh, um, thick skin. Um, you need to show confidence, but you need to also show humility. You need to be humble. You can never be arrogant. What not to do when communicating with investors? Be dishonest in any way. You cannot be dishonest. Be arrogant or unfriendly. Be overly aggressive. We get sometimes what we feel is harassed by in, uh, um, startup founders who are chasing us even after we say, no, that's not nice. That means that these people can go on our blacklist, even if it's a good business idea. You don't want to seem indecisive. 
although it is okay if you say that, I don't know, let me do my research and come back. Talking so much that you cannot get a word in from the investor. Being slow to follow up, that could be a killer. Breaking an agreement, whether it's verbal or written. Creating detailed financials. Go ahead, Yazan, you have something to say. Yeah, I'm curious, uh, Tamara, what's your process uh, for vetting the person, right? So you like the business plan and they're saying all the right thing in, in a professional setting or context, um, but you know, usually they're coming in with their best behavior. So what is your process to uh, vet the person as such, whether they're a good fit from a cultural values perspective? That's not easy to bet, to be honest, but one thing is that's important for us is having that person interact with several of our team members. And then in our pipeline, internal pipeline meeting, talking about our impressions of that person and the team that we are seeing. Um, and uh, um, that can be very helpful. Asking around, uh, because again, um, the network is, is uh, small um, and it's helpful to talk to other people about the opportunities. We as investors, like I mentioned in the last session, we talk to each other. We ask about the founders that we uh, um, come across. Interacting with those, invest, uh, with those uh, startup founders for, I wouldn't say a long period of time, but over multiple opportunities, asking them to come in, visiting them at their uh, um, uh, offices, going out for a coffee or a dinner with them, meeting their families and friends when possible. That's always very helpful. One trick we learned that we try to apply as much as possible, although it's not easy, visiting them at their homes. That's something that we learned, especially as mezzanine investors. We need to get to know as much about them as, as possible. In a lot of cases, we talk to the banks as well. And of course, in addition to getting the CRIF or the credit reports uh, and asking them to provide them, not just asking for the bank for them, talking to the bankers to see if they've had previous interactions and dealings with those startup founders. So basically, or in summary, doing as much as we can to gather as much information about those startup founders as uh, possible. One thing that we do at Amam Ventures as well is um, uh, enroll those startup founders in some of the technical assistance programs that we have going on. That helps with getting them readier for investment, whether we invest in them or others um, invest in them, but also that allows us the chance to interact with them over a longer period of time to get to know them and maybe get to meet more of their team members. That's great. Uh, just wondering, have you had uh, of late any deal where it was just great on paper, but you had to say no because you felt that the character of the person or the team was not uh, aligned with Amman? Absolutely. Absolutely. We've had several of those where we felt that the founder was too pushy. Um, we gave that founder an A plus for perseverance, but we felt that that's not a good fit for us. Uh, we've had cases where the founder did not have their story straight. We had cases where uh, the founders could not defend their numbers. Um, and uh, yeah, it, was, it wasn't easy in a lot of cases to say no. Again, we don't like saying no unless we really have to. We remember, we have limited funding resources. We have limited dry powder. So we need to prioritize and we need to find those the best deals that are out there. Um, because we are an ecosystem player, um, if we come across good deals that don't fit our criteria, we make sure that we connect them to other investors because we we felt that we like the idea and we want to see it grow. So um, we try and do our best to give the advice to the uh, um, uh, startup founder, but only if we click with that founder and we see that that founder is someone who's worth believing in and worth supporting. And there are a lot out there, but there are some bad apples again that we have to say no to and try not to talk to again later. Yeah, I hear you. You have two questions on the chat, uh, by the way, Tamara. Maybe it's a good time since we're kind of chatting before you move on. Uh, sure. 
Um, so one question from Sahar, what if the idea is not available in the market we are targeting, knowing we know that it is available in other markets and we considered uh, other and non-direct competitors? You need to be clear with your investors about that. Um, and you need to include that in your pitch. We love it when investors in general love it when the idea is not available in a specific uh, 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 market. But again, saying that it's not even available globally or there's no one like us, it makes us question uh, um, the pitch and the founder. So uh, you need to show that you've done your research. There are other uh, maybe uh, as, um, uh, offerings with uh, some similar features, but there are unique features that you need to show um, uh, in, in your pitch. And um, now, uh, Maha, asking how do you ask banks, do you take a consent uh, from the person? Of course, when going to the uh, uh, bank to get that proof report, it's we start by asking the company to get that proof report themselves or uh, giving us approval to ask their bank. Um, and they actually have to sign a form in order for the bank to provide that information to us. In a lot of cases, we ask the firm to go and get it from the bank and provide it to us. Uh, so absolutely, uh, um, yeah, yes, it's it's confidential information. We can't get it ourselves, and getting the proof system is too expensive, so we can't afford to have it uh, at uh, Amount Ventures, uh, and I'm sure a lot of investors can't afford to have it yet. Um, anything, uh, uh, another thing that's important uh, um, for you not to do when communicating with investors is using silly market size numbers without clear justification. So again, I was looking at a pitch yesterday where uh, the founder had uh, included a slide with a total addressable market um, and then showing how that addressable market is split into the different parts of the world, but then the numbers don't add up. So again, it can be not just silly market size numbers, but also the numbers not adding up and that can be very embarrassing. Claiming you know something that you don't or being afraid that you say you don't know. Again, don't be embarrassed. We say, we always say we don't know. And that's something I learned very early on as a management consultant. Go back and, you do, and do your research. You're not expected to have all the answers. On the contrary, you'll be respected if you say, I don't know, give me a couple of days and I'll get back to you. Spending time on the obvious, wasting the time of um, the investors or your bankers on something that's very clear, something that everyone knows. Getting, uh, getting caught up in unimportant details. Don't let the meeting get away with you from you. Focus on what's important. Asking for an NDA, and we've had a lot of those cases. Um, if you ask your invest, the potential investor for an NDA, that investor is seeing so many pitches, uh, um, hundreds of them throughout the year. We don't want to waste time uh, uh, reviewing an NDA, especially if you're going to send your own template. Um, we don't want to uh, engage our lawyer, um, expensive lawyers in reviewing multiple NDAs. We are happy to provide our own template if you want. But again, if you're not trusting that investor, especially if you've done your homework and you know that investor is actually a good one, you're not, invest, uh, you're not uh, trusting that investment process, then you're wasting the time of the investor. Try to play investors off each other when you are not a fundraising ninja. If you're not that experienced in fundraising and then try to play investors against each other, remember, investors talk to each other. Uh, the region is very small. So try to negotiate in real time. Take your time. Go back. Do your homework. Talk to your mentors. Talk to your advisors just to make sure that you're taking the right decisions and over-optimizing your valuation or worry too much about dilution. If you need the funding, um, look at the value that that investor is creating to you uh, for your business. Um, again, you're giving up equity. It is expensive, but if that investor is the right investor for you, you should not care too much about that. Taking no personally, again, investors will say no. You'll hear a lot of no's in your life. Um, so don't take it personally, move on and go to the next investor. Now, just like any sales process, you need to think of fundraising as a similar process. Looking at the questions before we move on, 
um, how, when pitching, what would be the best scenario of the size of the presentation or the time you usually give in engaging? The time is difficult to uh, uh, gauge, but for the uh, presentation or the pitch deck, it shouldn't be long. 15 slides maximum, 20 with backup slides. Those five extra slides can be in, in a backup uh, uh, deck. But again, you need to be very concise. You need to be able to answer all the basic questions in the deck and then get back to the uh, investor for any additional questions. You need to be able to engage the investor in a conversation. And you don't want the investor just reading the pitch deck. You need the investor to be asking you questions and having a conversation with you. Now, it is a sales process. Understanding VC's mindset is often as important as understanding the mindsets of your customers. I don't know if you remember that from the previous session. A great tip is to think about fundraising as a strategic sales process. It's not uh, um, dissimilar to a big ticket enterprise sales. Uh, while technically you are selling a commodity that's shares or equity in your startup, you are also selling value and make sure that you portray that value in all your communications with the investor. That realization will give you an important insight and a sharper competitive edge. Again, fundraising is a long process, but if it is done well, it should start long before you schedule that meeting with the investor. You need to prepare so much before you get to that first meeting. The process needs to begin even before you actually need it. You cannot wait until you run out of money and then go and start fundraising. That's too late. You need to have your cash flow projections in front of you. You need to look at them at least on a weekly basis. You need to calculate your runway constantly, update those numbers, and have a fundraising roadmap early on. Raising funds has a lot in common with sales. It means that it can be both incredibly rewarding and lucrative if done well, but also it can be off-putting and frustrating if done wrong. With that, mind, with that in mind, here are the ways to look at startup funding um, as a salesperson. You need to qualify those fundraising opportunities that you have. So even before you approach um, anyone, you need to have an outline of who your qualified target is. What type of investors do you need to be looking at? Um, is it an angel investor or is it family and friends or it is a VC fund that's focused on a specific geography or a specific uh, um, industry? Uh, do you need to create a list of those uh, uh, targets? You need uh, uh, to, as you identify your type and begin to approach people, you need to investigate the range, the range of investments they are capable of. You can go in and ask for a $50,000 ticket size if that investor invests 250 k as a minimum. They won't look at you. If you, need, if you know that you need a VC uh, fund, do your due diligence um, on their past and current investments. Just look at their portfolio companies. What have they done before? Who did they invest in before? What geography, what industries, what stage uh, of companies do they invest in? And if you know that you need angel investors uh, or you need to target family and friends, think of what those in individuals' motivations are. Um, what payoff they would be looking at before you talk to them and try and convince them to come into your uh, startup. So again, you need to create a tracker listing um, uh, the universe of investors that you can approach and again, start collecting information and data about those investors in order for you to assess who are the ones that you need to be approaching. Then you need to start building relationships. Uh, you can't just go up to someone and ask for money. Uh, this is when uh, uh, salespeople start uh, uh, sounding icky. You don't buy from those people. The best way is to engage uh, um, with the investor through a personal connection as a starting point. Um, if you're looking for a VC fund, you have qualified three uh, uh, funds, for instance, you have qualified or identified three partners in those different uh, uh, funds, it's a good idea to actually uh, um, meet them at events that you know that they would be attending, uh, go to networking events, try and find out uh, what they tweet about, uh, if they blog, follow their blog, uh, follow them on LinkedIn, and try and build a connection with them. You can't just 
drop an email and expect to build a personal relationship or simply call them and expect to get to that stage. Again, uh, you need to discover their interests, look at their LinkedIn profiles, look at who they are connected to, and maybe find someone in common and ask that person to uh, introduce you. Um, a social uh, introduction is very helpful. Um, in an in-person event, um, again, you don't want to give a cold, cold pitch, but you can walk up to that person or find someone to introduce you to that person. Again, look at it as a sales funnel, just like you're selling a product or selling a service and you built a sales funnel or a pipeline, a list of opportunities that you qualify over time. You try and understand who takes a decision at that investment fund, uh, who validates that decision, who the gatekeeper is, who the influencer on the decision is, et cetera. You need to build that uh, map of who are the different people at the investment fund are and how to get through to them and get them interested. You always need to be closing. That's the ABC of any sales transaction. So once you've qualified, you've created your funnel, uh, you started building your uh, fundraising prospects and you started building those relationships, you need to keep an eye on what it will take to close those prospects. Some of the things you need to ask is, what do they need to see from you to make the investment worthwhile? What kind of uh, um, returns are they motivated by? Uh, do they have existing investments that can be a conflict of interest to your startup? What would they miss out um, uh, if they don't invest in you. And you need to communicate that to them when, uh, you when you have that conversation. How can you ensure they know that uh, they miss out if they don't invest with you? Have there been opportunities that they have let go? There is no investor who's motivated after they've missed something or they lost an opportunity that's similar to what you are presenting. The best funding Fundraising borrows key sales steps, qualifying, building relationships, and always be closing. If done well, raising funds can be rewarding and lucrative, but otherwise it won't happen. It needs to be seen as a win-win for everyone involved. And again, when you close, know when you have actually closed. The worst thing is that the investor says yes, and you continue trying to sell, trying to convince. Okay, that will be of putting to the investors. Another question before we get to investor relations, uh, the investors from uh, the question is from Adel. If an investor gets a pro rata agreement in place and asks us to execute certain revenue opportunities before going for our core pitch, do you include the new revenue, which is a little out of the core focus? Um, in other words, he wants us to get to Series A before we invest heavily in the technology. Do we follow our latest investor and his crunches or stay course uh, with our past investors? Or stay, uh, I'm not sure I understand uh, the, the question. Adil, would you like to um, go unmute, uh, uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask a question? Yeah, and I apologize if there's a loud uh, noise. Can you do me? Uh, so um, in the background, um basically what i'm asking is we have a new investor who's come in he's given us his first tranche but he likes we've presented several of the opportunities uh for revenue he wants us to go for them for example we are focused on i don't want to get too in in football but we have an opportunity with the ministry of education to do other sports as well it's a little bit out it, it's not in the professional realm it's to it's for younger children and he wants us to go for this revenue, get it, um, and and before we invest heavily in the, he feels that we need 20 million to solve the problem we're solving. Um, and we just know the other people that came in earlier thought we can solve it with, you know, 300K and so forth. So I, I guess my question is, how do you manage and i guess i should have i asked it too early managing investor relations how do you juggle between the past investors that have come in and now the new one who's tranched uh who's tranching us and giving us money um if we're going to take a, a, a i don't know if it's really a pivot but it's a way to collect money to get revenue for us so one thing you need to target all the time is what we call smart money 
And you need to make sure that that money is really, and that investor is aligned with your vision for your startup. If that investor is asking you to pivot, you need to go back to, the, to your other investors. Remember, they're, they can be your sounding board um, and uh, uh, see if that's something that uh, um, they can find convincing. Um, if you are convinced yourself, but if you're just um, pivoting because you want that money that new investor is going is bringing, that might, that might not be smart. So again, you need to go back to your vision and see if there is alignment. And of course, engage with your older investors because they're your first believers. Uh, you can't just uh, uh, ignore them. Thank, thank uh, you. Yeah. I, I mean, we, he's influential. He's a smart investor. Um, we, do, we do believe in what he says somewhat. He's, he's very influential, but we also know he just has a lot of money. And for him, the, if we execute what he says, he keeps giving us money. Um, uh, so so you could, if, if you find what he's offering convincing to you as um, a founding team, then you should be able to go back and convince uh, your other investors uh, of uh, uh, that pivot or that change in direction. Uh, okay. If it's if you believe in, then you should be able to communicate it with them. Okay. Okay. So it's not like you're, st you've answered my question. It's not like we're stuck staying the same course if uh, past investors have come in on that. They understand there could be pivots. Um, absolutely, absolutely, okay. absolutely. But I'm asking if there is a certain or recommended timeline to close a, a deal. Not really, but you need to do it as fast as possible because, like I mentioned, investors uh, um, can get distracted by other opportunities. And um, if it takes too long, that means. So again, when we look at our investment process in Amam Ventures. Um, we say that the process can take anywhere between six to eight weeks, depending on the readiness of the company. So if the, comp if the founder has all the documentation in place, the financial projections, the legal documents, so the data room is ready and complete, the process can take very uh, a little time. But in a lot of cases, uh, um, the, the startup are not ready. And this means that uh, we need to go back and uh, as a startup founder, work on the documentation that's required, revise the financial projections. In our case, um, a lot of the work that we do is front loaded. So we go in and help with creating that documentation, but that means that the process can take longer. Um, so it really uh, uh, depends on you, on how ready you are before you actually start talking to investors. Like I said, make sure that that data room is ready, that everything you need is in place. And uh, whenever a question, uh, um, an investor asks for certain documents, you're sending it that same day or the next day before the investor gets distracted with someone else. Um, Yazan is asking me to go back and explain um, a pro rata agreement uh, that Adil was referring to. Actually, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, so maybe I can ask Adil to explain that. Yeah, the pro, pro rata is he's asked uh, explicitly to be able not to be diluted, but not uh, by he as our shares dilute, he can keep investing. Um, that's what I meant by the pro rata agreement um, where he can, because he's asked for a board seat with his investment as well. But um, I think there's a big, there was a big difference um, because initially when we, we did this, it, um, there's a difference between non-dissolution uh, and we had to fix, we had to go back and fix that because non-dissolution uh, like and, and other rounds means they hold on to a chunk of a percentage that never changes. I guess pro rata means that in other rounds, they have the option to keep the same percentage, but they have to keep putting money in. Um, if I've explained that correctly. Okay, so you're looking at a way that does not dilute um, an existing investor's uh, or a new investor's uh, ownership stake in the business. Correct. Uh, a way where they keep their same percentage in the business. Um, you know, if they have 3%, they wanna hold on to it no matter what through the series uh, on and on and on. In the next uh, round. In the next rounds. Okay, good, all right. 
So looking at investor relations, uh, these are key to success. Uh, basically, they're all about trust and uh, credibility, and this is uh, important with existing and prospective investors. You can build those relationships um, through having a strong investor relations uh, or relationship management process. Um, the probability of investors investing in a company and staying invested is higher when they trust and believe in that company. Uh, they, they might be willing to give put in more money if they believe in that company. Potential investors can be added to startups through strong investor relations. Investors are more likely to invest in a company if they see that it is transparent and responsive to their questions and concerns. Updating uh, investors is extremely important. They need to know about the company's performance and future plans, and this is part of this investment and uh, relationship management process. With this information at hand, investors can make more informed decisions when making their investment decisions. Communication and transparency between the company and its investors are also enhanced by strong investor relations. By doing this, misunderstanding can be avoided as well as potential conflicts. Uh, um, I can't emphasize how important investor relations are. We want you as startup founders to focus on your business, but you need to be talking to us and as investors. You cannot ignore your investors and go back to them uh, when you're running out of cash. You need, to engage, you need to engage them as long as they're investors in your business. So the steps um, uh, for you to build that process, you need to set goals and identify your target audience and develop key messages for your investor relations, depending on the type of investor. You need to create a plan that includes regular investor updates and communications. You need to respond to investor questions. You cannot ignore their questions. You need to answer their concerns in a transparent and timely manner. Again, Regular investor updates are important, but also you need to have video calls, you need to have face-to-face -face meetings with them. You need to, when possible, you need to automate and streamline your investor relations. Use technology, use your CRM tool uh, where possible. And you need to engage investors by understanding their interests and building relationships. Uh, again, using social media, using other platforms, engaging with them regularly is extremely important. And you need to listen to their feedback and make changes where necessary. One of the killers uh, for that investor relationship is when investors are giving advice, they see something is going wrong, they speak out, and the founder does not listen. Successful investor relationship is a two-way street and requires constant communication and collaboration. So investor relationship management 101 means that uh, you need to focus as a startup founder on building that relationship. You cannot delegate that relationship to somewhere, someone else. We know that building a startup is in incredibly difficult. Um, this makes you feel sometimes that uh, uh, leading the company, growing it is almost impossible. And on top of building a product, uh, selling your product, marketing your product, building a team, you are responsible for engaging with your stakeholders, especially your investors, your mentors, and your board members. Investors can seem like a source of capital, but remember, uh, they can offer you so much more. They can offer future capital, they can offer their own experience, they can offer their network to help move your business forward. It is your responsibility to have a game plan in place to communicate and leverage your investors. Um, just like you, a lot of us have been operators before. We've not only built an investment fund, which is sort of like a startup, a lot of us come from an entrepreneurial background and have built and run our own companies. So we, again, we can offer future capital, but again, we can provide a lot from our own personal experiences and our other investment experiences, because we're talking to a lot of companies all the time our own network. We are always willing to engage our network, helping you whether find uh, um, new employees or helping you find customers. If you're looking to expand into a new car, uh, market, chances are your investor has a connection that can help make that happen. Reach out to your investor and don't just wait until you run out of money. Again, these business-centric meetings, these business-centric emails are very important. 
but make sure that you build a personal relationship at the same time. Just go out and hang out with your investors um, every now and then. Schedule um, uh, um, a catch-up uh, session over a coffee or a dinner. So you need to have monthly investor updates. Companies that regularly communicate with your investors, with the investors, are 300% more likely to raise follow-on funding. If we have that relationship, we don't want to go out and invest in a new relationship. It's easier to continue uh, doing more with what you have. A monthly investor update can go a long way when it comes to building relationship with your investors. Monthly updates should not take more than a few minutes of your time, but can pay dividends down the road, can add a lot of value to that relationship. Um, again, find time to do that monthly investor update. Quarterly board meetings are extremely important. Monthly updates are great for keeping investors in the loop and getting their input on the fly, but quarterly board meetings are a great opportunity to look back um, at the quarter and shape the future roadmap with decisions uh, and decisions with your board. Quarterly board meetings will allow you to sit down with the stakeholders and spend valuable time digging into future decisions and strategies. Make sure that you schedule those as much as possible in advance so that uh, um, you get the attention of your uh, board members. And again, it is very important for you as a founder to come well prepared to that meeting. It is very frustrating for a board member to come into a board meeting without knowing the agenda, without having received documentation in, adv in advance. It means that you don't respect their time and you don't want them to prepare for that meeting. Make sure you prepare and help them prepare in order for you to maximize uh, um, the value of that one hour or two hours you're spending with your investors. One of one off, one off meetings are also very important. Monthly investors and quarterly board meetings are, again, that's the minimum that you should do, but you need to have one off meetings because Throughout that journey, you will have questions, you will need to have conversations uh, with your investors. So make sure that you reach out to them and schedule those meetings as needed. Uh, this is an opportunity to tap into not only the capital, the network and the experience, but this helps you strengthen that personal relationship with the investor. And again, this requires planning. You can't go into this without a plan. Like, we, like I said, a startup founder is extremely busy with building the product, building the company, the team, uh, uh, um, customer relationship, et cetera. So um, whenever you get a chance, try to, to systemize things and build things into a process as much as possible. So you need to create an investor relations plan as a tool to help you uh, raise capital. This plan outlines your strategy for communicating and managing the relationship with your current, but also your potential investors. And this plan will build awareness of your startup, will build awareness of your products and services among potential investors. This plan will educate potential investors about your business model and your investment opportunity. It will position your company as a thought leader in its industry. It will generate in, uh, interest in your company among those potential investors. It will create a favorable impression of the company and it will foster relations with potential but also existing uh, 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 investors. It will keep current investors informed about your progress. What do you need to tell your investors? Quarterly, you need to provide information about your financial health, your key KPIs, your recent achievements, any concerns, any challenges, roadblocks, and your plans for the next reporting period. But on the spot, when significant changes occur, you need to immediately inform your investors. When you need advice, don't wait, reach out and ask for that advice. When you need help, when you need access to an opportunity, to a potential client, to um, a potential uh, uh, market, but also more importantly, when you're in financial trouble, don't wait when things go wrong, reach out to the investor and talk to them. Just as important as fundraising, managing relations to existing investors is one of your key responsibilities as a founder. I know it takes a lot of time. You don't have that much time. It does not uh, impact 
uh, your business operations directly, but it is very uh, important. It is a useful investment of your time because it builds the foundation for a well-functioning founder-investor relationship and team. Again, one person that's normally the CEO, the main founder, you should be responsible for that relationship, but also invest uh, um, involve others in your team to help you in the process. Creating that monthly update, you might want your co-founder to help you with providing that input, but sending that out that email needs to come from you as the CEO of the business. Always ask for help when you need it. Again, you want to show your investors that you're strong, you're reliable, things are going well, but you might feel that when you're asking for advice that shows some weakness, you're wrong. Although you might be afraid to ask for help from your investors because it means that you're not prepared um, or you're not fulfilling your promise, that's not the way that investor perceives, perceives it. The investors, they want to help you. They want to make sure that you succeed and they're happy to take the calls. Um, reach out to them. Uh, um, it's extremely important. And make sure that you communicate bad news promptly. In a lot of cases, founders wait until that board meeting or try and push that uh, bad news under the carpet. They try to hide it. That's not healthy. You shouldn't do that ever. The founders can feel nervous about disclosing that they're going through a crisis. But again, it does not surprise us as investors. It is expected. Again, 20% of new companies fail in the first year. 50% uh, meet their end during the first five years. So we know that. We expect that some of the companies uh, um, can fail. We even include that in our own financial models. We expect to write off some of the investments we make. And that's why go come and share that bad news uh, whenever it happens. So again, just as we are no strangers to failure, you need to be prepared for that possibility as well. <laughs> that's, that's a quote from one investor where he says that the only time I've ever truly become angry with a startup happened after they didn't communicate anything for a long time. So they basically disappeared. When they finally made contact, it was to tell me that they had one month left on runway and needed to figure something out quickly. But then it's often too late to do anything. Again, think of it just like when kids go up to their parents the night before a project deadline and say, we have this major project that's due tomorrow. We don't like those surprises. We can't help you when you give us those surprises. It is also critical that your investors hear bad news from you first. You don't want investors to hear about your bad news in a networking event or on social media. That's the worst thing that can happen. It is detrimental to your relationship with your investor if you don't have confidence in them and don't share that bad news. Communicating with investors doesn't need to be difficult, but it must be intentional. You need to have that plan in place. Make sure that you interact with your investors in your monthly updates, your quarterly board meetings, in your one-off meetings. And again, every now and then, start, uh, uh, communicate with your investors, reach out, text, drop an email, call the investor. Good communication nurtures the kind of partnership that begins with your first pitch deck, but lasts well beyond the exit. You can always tap into your investors even after they exit your startup. You can ask them for support and they would be very happy to provide it. So that's it for me. This is my email. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and I will do my best to answer. Uh, I'm always, uh, uh, I can say that uh, prompt when answering emails. Uh, I always try my best, even if it's not a pipeline or a portfolio company, because as an investor, I feel that it is my duty to support upcoming founders. So please feel free to reach out. Uh, one question from Ahmed. In terms of patient capital, our project is all about science, tangible product, and the R&D of environmental solution for businesses that also entails significant operational cost saving, we recycle industrial wastewater. So, so from your experience, what is the possibility to find institutional patient capital in Jordan? Ahmed, I have to tell you that anything that has to do with climate is, is extremely important globally. A lot of funds are coming up looking for uh, to invest with a climate lens and uh, um, 
I know that um, in the region, there are several funds who would be interested in your story. They would be interested in giving patient capital. And um, uh, even as investors, they would be willing to come in as angel investors just because of what you're trying to do. Um, the challenge that I've been seeing is that there aren't many of you who are focused on providing um, environment and climate related solutions. With COP28 uh, um, happening in the UAE in a couple of months, again, that's bringing a lot of interest um, to what you're trying to do um, uh, in the region. So um, I'd be happy to make a couple of connections, reach out over, over email, and uh, um, so you can tell me a bit more about what you're doing. Um, any other questions? I have a question. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, she, thank you so much, uh, Tamara. Um, I think uh, what's what's important here is that um, really what you're doing as far as uh, the venture conversation goes beyond just the immediate deals. And I, I love how you personally and Imam go about that because really this is about creating communities, creating uh, pathways and, and pipelines that might not be immediately obvious now, but maybe Ahmed will be will be ready, uh, by the way, as a female co-founder, will be ready um, soon in a, in a year and a half. And, you know, your conversation with him and you offering um, to support uh, goes a long way, I think. My question has to do with the reporting and does Imam use any type of uh, uh, cloud-based solutions to manage your portfolio companies and what does that look like? Does it require uh, startups in order to to ease the, the burden of communication? Uh, have you had uh, experience with that? Are you using any tools? So at the stage, we're using templates. Remember that we only started a couple of years ago. So um, we're building our processes just like the startup founders are building theirs. Uh, we started with a very good uh, CRM system that we use for pipeline and deal flow management. Um, and uh, for any startup that applies for funding on our website, that automatically feeds into our pipeline management system. We actually had a conversation, we've been having conversations about portfolio management and the reporting that's needed. We're using a lot of Excel uh, uh, based templates that we share with uh, um, our uh, portfolio companies as part of our onboarding process, just to make sure that they're able to build their uh, reporting function effectively. We actually have a fractional CFO as one of the services, one of the support uh, services that we offer to our portfolio company. So we have someone come in, look at their financial reports, make sure that uh, they're doing their finances in an eff effective manner. But we, we were having a demo from one uh, um, uh, um, Dutch company last week, actually, who have built their own portfolio management companies, uh, uh, software that portfolio companies can have access to so that they can upload their reports and their data, their impact measures, et cetera. So that's in the making, but uh, yeah, that's that's very important because Excel sheets can get very complicated. Great, great. And, um, you know, since we have a couple of minutes, I don't know if anybody has any questions to raise their hands, but uh, I'll ask you to, uh, again, I know you mentioned this in the first session, but it would be great to also um, reiterate on Imam's uh, kind of focus, uh, who, who you're looking at, again, so that you don't get bombarded with a lot of non, non relevant uh, emails and requests. So Absolutely, and I appreciate that, uh, uh, Yazan. So um, like Yazan mentioned at the start, Amam Ventures is um, a gender lens investment fund. And this means that we invest in companies that have a female founder or at least 30% female leadership or at least 30% female employment or a product or service that caters for women or girls. And we're looking at two types of companies or two segments. One is traditional brick and mortar SMEs that are established, that have been around for two years at least, and are already generating a minimum of $200,000 in revenues. 
and we support and invest in those businesses through an instrument called revenue capital. So it's a revenue-based uh, um, uh, uh, financing instrument. The other type that uh, we are supporting are tech-enabled uh, startups um, that are post-seed but pre-series A and are looking to get readier for their series A round. So we provide them with a bridge round that helps them get to that stage. We use an, we use an instrument called the redeemable note. So it's a cousin to the convertible note that has a revenue-based uh, uh, um, uh, redemption component. Uh, so th these are the types of companies we're looking at uh, uh, investing in at this stage. We're sector agnostic and we're targeting companies um, for now in the Levant region. Uh, we started with Jordan. Uh, we're uh, um, looking at Lebanon. We're looking at uh, Palestine and uh, Egypt. And uh, we know that there are very interesting opportunities in those markets. And that's why we're doing a lot of technical assistance work through our Arcan arm uh, in order for us to help develop that pipeline um, and create more investable companies for us, but also for the others in the ecosystem. Fantastic, that's great. Um... All right, so Nadine shared uh, a quick uh, form to evaluate the session. The best time to do it is immediately, so please uh, click on that. And uh, Tamara, I mean, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear you and to engage with you in conversation. We're looking forward to, to more collaboration. We're also looking forward as the core grows and, and builds its sustainability model uh, for it to as well be a, a better pipeline uh, for Imam uh, in the future. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for all our uh, founders uh, and foundresses um, in, in, in the core. And for the, all of those that uh, watched us on the live stream or watching this in recording, um, much love to all. Thank you so much, Tamara. This has been amazing. Thank you so much. I look forward to next time.